Shalom to teach uh, the, their, uh, their uh, what do you want to call them? Their followers, their sheep, their, their congregations, their whatever you want to call them. And so I have embarked ever so, uh, I don't know, you know all the words. Inferious, inferior, inferior thinking that I have not uh, the abilities to do this, but you know I do know I do have. It's just going to require a lot of work and time to to have it manifest. But I know by the power of the Spirit of God, any of us can do anything. So if it, if he if I happen to be the one that has been appointed to go over there and minister and speak as often as I have then I guess if they request for me to write something for them, uh, like a syllabus, then, then I am capable of doing it. So I'm going to do it, and this is the third, I believe, or fourth, the third or fourth lesson, which is corresponding to the third or fourth chapter in this book slash syllabus, this lesson today. So we went through three other chapters, and now we're approaching this chapter that I've called just at least for the time being, Recreation and man. Recreation and man was supposed to be a part of last week's, but last week's turned into to such a lengthy discourse, we kind of separated out this week's, which has also the same kind of feel as I had last time, in that I had to break out a portion of this into the next chapter because it grew and grew and grew, and I felt I was doing a disservice by trying to be so short on all these subjects, and I, if anything, I think I should overkill, then I should underkill. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to overkill. And I noticed there was a few authors, one I'm thinking of in my mind right now, I think he overkills. <laughs> I said, my goodness, I got that point about an hour ago. Do you have to continue saying the same thing? But I think it's better than leaving me short thing. I wonder what he meant. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I hope to be found guilty of overkill in some of these subjects as opposed to not having said enough but so that's why I invite you you you'll you'll say well he said this before he never said that this time that's because I can't remember and even if I could remember what I've said in the past I, I would fill up all our time and I wouldn't have time to move on so it remind me of a good point when you read and uh, text me or let me know and I'll put it in the name of this well, it's first of all, it's chapter 3. Anyway, that's what I have at the front. And it's called Recreation and Man. We talked about creation as opposed to recreation. We talked about creation as opposed to recreation last week, and I think it was last week, and uh, brought out a lot of points. And as I said, this was supposed to fit inside of last week's lesson, but it didn't, so it's out now on its own in a different chapter. And it's more focused down on a few other points that are a part of the recreation. We spoke in terms of last week more about those things that preceded recreation than we actually did about recreation, or as much about those things that preceded recreation uh, than we spoke about those that, of recreation. And if you are lost on what I just said, I'm just saying there was a pre-adamant world that we talked about that I believe was fairly well proofed up in scripture, and if not, it's shadowed, and if not, it doesn't really matter anyway. So, But I, I think it believe, I believe that God has revealed just enough about it in his shadows that it adds some depth to his salvation plan, to those who care to hear, to spare it out, to search it out, and look into God's heart. And uh, you, you can't help but say why at every corner when you're looking for God's heart. Why, 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 why did you do that? Why do you do that? And you hope to hear from the Spirit of the Lord. So it just gets deeper. Well, it's unfathomable. Recreation and man. And this is a scripture that I bring out because it's so pertinent, so important to our overall understanding to get the big picture is to understand what is meant in this scripture verse that was written many years ago by Isaiah. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, 
and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46.10. In other words, in uh, modern day language, English, we could say, without doing any harm to this, that God knew the end from the beginning, and he told it. He told it. And uh, he told the end in the beginning, from the beginning. So we keep that as a banner over our minds as we look into the depth of the scripture. And then we look on beyond the black to the white, and we discover there's as much white as there is black. To find the end of the matter, we go to the beginning. I've said, to understand the book of Revelation, you have to go back to the beginning. To find the end of the matter, we go to the beginning. The book of Genesis, meaning beginnings, or at least Bereshith is the Hebrew word for the book, uh, beginnings, reveals as much, if not more, prophetical as it does historical. Now, I think that's where um, maybe, to some degree, the Pharisees and the scribes of Christ's day got a little bit dark in that they looked at the Torah, Moses' writings, especially this book of Genesis, and especially these first three chapters, is more of an historical kind of, of, of uh, dissertation as opposed to a prophetical. And what I want to do is go past the historical. You can go, you can spend a long time on the historical part of the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And that's mainly where I'm focusing today. But I want to go beyond that and go into the depth behind the historical where we'll find the prophetical. And as I said, there's as much, if not more, to be gleaned from that portion, part or form of the first three chapters than there are in just studying the text as it relates to the historical. These first chapters give us a glimpse into the mindset of God. I think that's what sets the pace for the rest of the Word of God. If you can get his mindset from the beginning, you can kind of see where he's going toward the end. They, uh, they go far beyond just these, these first few chapters. They go far beyond just the plain text recreation narrative of how things got here. I think that's the first probably reason that we go to the first chapter of Genesis to begin with on our journey is just to find out uh, how things got here. How did I get here? What, what's this about? Uh, but those things that I'm speaking to you about in the mindset of God, that is to say the hidden within awaiting their discovery, are the multiple future critical purposes of God to be realized over his set timeline that clearly has a predestined beginning and ending. You know, if the Lord God says declaring the end from the beginning, there must be an end and a beginning. <laughs> I don't know why it is that we would think anything other than this has an end. It had a beginning, and it has an end. And God knows both, both, and he declares both to us who are somewhere along the way between the end and the beginning. It should be, under, and it's predestined. It's going to happen. Well, someone prayed and thanked God for his, yeah, I think it was Kathy, she, she prayed and thanked God for his sovereignty. This is one where, place where God has exercised his sovereignty, and it will have an end. He exercised it in the beginning to create it, and he exercises his sovereignty in the end to finish it. It should be understood that God had in full view from the beginning of recreation, that that we read about in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, its end. He had in full view its end. No one else had it. There was no other creature that or being that had the understanding of, the, of its end, but God had it in his heart. And that is its final 
purifying destruction. That is foreordained, predestined, and will surely happen in the future. We have the scriptural understanding of, the, of that in Isaiah chapter 66 and then in Revelation 21.1. I don't think we need to read it because I think everyone is familiar, very familiar with the end. The end is that God burns this, that he has recreated up, and he creates a new heavens and a new earth. The written word is God revealing what was or is in his heart and mind from before the beginning. Didn't we establish that in the last lesson that God had, had, had uh, set about before the foundation of the world to, to do the things that he has done in the recreation and is doing. So he has, he has and is revealing from the beginning of this world and from the past beginning and the future ending, it is possible, no, let's say it is required, to discover his present vital purposes and many helpful hidden truths layered within. What's he talking about? I said, well, there's an end, there's a, there's a beginning and there's an end. Well, there's also the, that that comes between the beginning and the end. And that's what we're really uh, uh, of, of great interest in since that's where we are. And, and in layered in his word, about the beginnings and the end, it is possible to discover the present vital purposes and many helpful hidden truths layered within that are increasingly discernible from his designs, types, and shadows. Now, originally I had in mind to do a chapter entitled Types and Shadows, <laughs> but I couldn't imagine what it is that I would do in that chapter in that I should be using whatever those things are throughout the whole uh, manuscript. Uh, otherwise, if I'm just saving them for a chapter, then it, they really have lost a lot of their relevance. So rather than have a chapter dedicated to types and shadows, I'm just going to weave it in. And I they believe you even suggested that last week, Debbie, and I believe that's a, that's a good plan. So we're Understanding that there is types and shadows, and we'll talk about that in a minute and define it, we can get an example from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11, which we've used often. And we could read the whole 11 verses, but the crux of it is, now all these things happened unto them, to the Israelites, for in samples. And then in the, I don't know, in your margin, in my King James margin, it says types. That word in samples means types. So we could write, we could have said, now all these things happen unto them for types. And they are written for our admonition. That's the word admonition again means a warning with instruction. And uh, then upon whom the ends of the world to come. So in other words, God has used, he is using types and shadows to exhort, to instruct, to teach to us who are. Uh, the ends of the world have come upon for our understanding, in other words, about the end. Types and shadows are similar to parables or parallels and is a frequent method of dramatic symbols helping to reveal great truths of Scripture often seen in prophecy, usually taking many years to fully develop or completely filled with their full meaning. These laid beside the other scriptures harmoniously show the fuller or more complete purposes of God in a mode or method only Almighty God could have envisioned or accomplished. Many illustrations of this kind of work, uh, this work of God, shall accompany this manuscript. Or this work. So we, we, I hope to point them out in these, a few of them. I can't point them all out because this, wouldn't, this would go on and on and on. This chapter would turn into a book. But I will point out a few. And then as we move through the other chapters in the book, 
we'll make many references and, and illustrations of what it is that God has used as a mode of showing us and revealing to us the white from the black, the depth in the word, his heart, his mindset from the beginning to the end. We'll discover that one very key way and manner is in types and shadows. It's God's way. It's not our way. We haven't, we haven't uh, made this way up to uh, look into the things of God. He set it before us and said, this is a method and means by which you may understand. So, as I said, many, uh, many illustrations shall accompany this work. And let's begin. Let's get it begin there in the first uh, three book, our first three chapters of the book of Genesis with this, with this verse. It says, so God created man in his own image and God blessed them. Being created in God's image, he must, of course, then be highly intelligent, right? And his body being most erect, you know, it, that's, that's something I don't know that we think a lot about, but do you know that we're erect? You see me? I'm erect. You know, look, think of any animal. Think of any creature. Can you find another one that is erect like us? See? God has made us in his image. Obviously, intelligent and erect. So therefore, in the recreation, he is superior to all other earthly beings. Man and all recreation declared by God to be then in a very good state. Genesis 1, 27, 28, and 31. I don't know. Some of these verses I'll read, but some I won't. I believe most of you, at least here, and understand that God, when he finished his creation, he said it was good. And then he followed that up with it is very good. So we have this man created in the image of God that God has stated is very good. That's good to note because we move forward, we find out he, 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 he is, is found in a state not so very good. So we know if he was in good state, how did he get in a not so very good state? Uh, of course, we know the story. Genesis 2 says, 2 7 says, and man became a living soul. I've said much about, and probably will write more here uh, when in the final product about a living soul. But for the sake of this lesson and the length of it, I will keep my words focused and narrowed down to saying a few specific things that are key to understanding uh, the fullness of the Word of God. He being described or defined here as a unique creation, something other, having some things in common, but distinctly different from that previously created spirit being angels, right? And the word tells us that in Hebrews 1, 7, where it says, and in other places, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits. So there we find a contrast in creations. We have the previous creation. At some point in the past before man, God created spirit beings called angels and other spirit beings that have been pointed out by God in the scripture by other names, but we know that they are, and they are consisting of that ethereal or that that's, that's unseen material called spirit, and they are of that realm, and we are of this realm, a material realm, but we are even more than that. We are living souls in the material realm. We are more than that because we have spirit, soul, and body, which more we will talk about in a minute. The moment I'm making a point that we are unique, uniquely made in the image of God. Man then being created in the image of the triune God is himself a triad being composed of spirit, soul, and body. I don't believe that it has to have a whole lot of explanation for these people that uh, this, the intent uh, 
is to a certain group of people that are ministering the truths of God. I don't think it's necessary to go into a lot about the Trinity, but the word there in the Hebrew, Elohim, that is used here often in the book, in the first three chapters, is the plural for God. And it is a hint of that which is, yes, he's Echad, one, but he's also the triune Elohim. So we are made in his image, and the point is then that we are a triad being, like God is a triune being, and that we are triad in the spirit, as we have a spirit. We are a living soul, and we have been encased or encased in a body. All of this is described here as how God formed shape blew into this this uh, this potter's clay uh, creation. The scripture, spirit, soul, and body references are 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and Hebrews 4.12 for two. We will come back to this uh, all-important subject later, and I might do a little drawing or I might not. I'm not sure, but I put this board behind me. We'll keep an eye on that clock. Man then being created in the image of the triune God is himself a triad being. But the fullest purpose and the meaning typed and shadowed in man, or Adam. This I have not heard taught anywhere. This is just, uh, I believe, a revelation that's very apparent from the word of God where it says, him, man, being made in the image of God must have been with, the one, with this one great hidden truth in view. You know, what I'm going back to that very first verse that I brought to your attention that God told the end from the beginning. I'm going back that he has designed in his design of Adam. This one hidden truth was in brought to bear when he made man in the image of God, that Adam, the first man, was to be the form in which the second Adam, Jesus Christ, was to come. Can you think of any better reason than to make him in his image than, than that he had in his heart and mind that he would he himself come and be encapsulated in that body? <laughs> and and that, that, that whatever that being consisted of m must have some of the consistencies that he would be in favor of having himself when he would become embodied in that, in that being. So the greatest reason for God to make man in his image was to make an abode for his future son. That's what he had in view. Along with the additional things that come into play later that we'll talk about that, that had to do with not only his coming in the first sense, but his second coming. And from that humble sacrificial coming, he by the resurrection of God, that is to say, raised up out from among the dead, became the first eternal glorified man. And we have proof that up in, in many scriptures, but the one that I chose and I like best for, for the teaching purposes that I have in mind, I am quoting 1 Corinthians 15 where it is a part of 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is worthy of your study, but this is a latter part. It is sown a natural body. What is sown a natural body? A human being is sown a natural body. Not just his body is sown a natural body, but he himself is sown a natural being. It is raised up, a raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Jesus was born into a natural body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As in the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as in the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 
So what was in view when God created man in his own image was not to leave him in a material state. Isn't that clear? That, that's what I, re I receive so gloriously out of these verses is that understanding that from the, from the beginning God had created and knew the end that it wasn't in this material state that he intended man to stay. In whose designed eternally glorious heavenly image those judged worthy at the end of time will be also resurrected in him and unto. Fulfilling that great original purpose of God, and when I say a great original purpose of God, this is before the foundation of the world. God had a plan before the foundation, before recreation ever even was uh, instituted, God had a plan. And in that plan, it was his plan that he would have royal sons. Enough of this, whatever he had. Enough of it. I will have royal sons. All right. I may be, there may be a little conjecture there, but I believe that's what the statement of God's heart mindset was. Enough of what I have, I will have royal sons. The reality and the method in which this is realized is written in Hebrew. All of these things are shadowed, are they not? They aren't in plain text. They don't just, and I decided I wanted royal sons and I didn't. Da, 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 da. You have to gather this information. You have to look at this mode and method by which God uses parables, parallels, types and shadows, prophetic word. You look at a, all of it, the written word, uh, the, uh, the passed down word, all of the methods in which God has used to bring about this accountability. And here's the scripture in Hebrews that tells us the story. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. I said it, and I, I think that that shows enough of this. Because who, uh, the, the world is, is at this point subjected to angels. It is angels who are in authority. But in God's world to come, in his kingdom to come, he has not put the, that world in subjection to angels. But one in a certain place testified, saying, this is a psalm, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Question mark. Thou madest him, man, Adam, a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. He's describing the, the cre recreation, and in the recreation, his creation of man. Adam, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under, his, under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all these things put under him, man, Adam. But we do see Jesus, second Adam, who was made, being the seed of a woman, a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now, as the man, as that man, crowned with glory, as that resurrected man, crowned with glory and honor, that he might that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So here's that mind in the view of God. His mindset was a transition from here to here, from here material to and the living soul into this spiritual soul, heavenly, in the type of the heavenly prototype, Jesus Christ, who would taste this, the sentence of the curse of death for all became him, God Almighty, for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. That was a mindset before the creation of man. Before he made him in his image, he had in his mindset 
I will have glorious royal sons. Many of them. How am I going to accomplish this? And he determined in his own mind and heart how he would do this. And we see through Christ Jesus he did this. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, I will declare thy name unto thy brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Another psalm. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. He's going to destroy him that has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I don't know about you, but I don't like the thought of death. I don't like it. I have never have liked it even though it's more palatable today to me than it was a number of years ago, I still don't, I'm not, I still haven't come to a real, a real internal consensus that that's the best thing. I haven't, have, I struggle with that, and, and I confess it. It's not something that I carnally or mentally through my reasoning uh, entertained with a joyous thought. But it is the reality of what we are since that day that is, we'll discover here in the third, second and third chapter of Genesis. And that's our condition. And it's the condition of every man that has ever lived. Even Christ. Isn't, didn't, didn't, didn't he wish this cup would pass? He wasn't really excited about this either. But we should know that this is God's justice being played out, but, and he has sent someone in our stead that there makes a method or a way that we might come through the death and out the other side. Before it was just go through the death and not come out the other side. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels. Here it goes back to the forming a man in his own image. But he took him on the seed of Abraham, or he took on him the seed of David, or he took upon him the seed of the woman, Mary. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, 5 through 18. I hope in through that you may find the glorious truth that God had predetermined that he wanted royal sons to share with him in the authority of the universe, of his entire kingdom. Thus, it is then Christ Jesus who is typed and shadowed in Genesis three fifteen. Moving to another verse here in these first three chapters of Genesis, where God is speaking to fallen Lucifer, who had just conspired with the serpent in man's fall, and wherein they had specifically targeted the woman, Eve. And I will, and here's the word of God as it relates to the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, uh, so to the manifest seed of woman, we may take the that reference there, as it relates to the manifest seed of woman, we may take the incarnation as the fulfillment of that part of the prophecy described in that fact, or after the fact. And here's the proof of Scripture 
I didn't, I didn't write the reference, but it is Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Familiar words. Who being in the form of God. He was with God before the world were founded. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Not, he thought it not robbery to God to not may retain or maintain himself in the Godhead. As, it, as he was eternally, but made himself of no reputation. Wasn't, he did not have, and I hesitate to use the word, but he had not one prideful little part in him, not one little piece of pride within him. Made himself of no reputation and took, him on, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we discover in that discourse in Scripture in Philippians 2 that that, that aligns itself and, had, and fulfills that verse wherein God said, I will make enmity between you and the woman and woman's seed, and, and your seed and her seed. And it is there in the incarnation that we can find that truth. And we can go on to see in that verse also a reference to the next part of, the, of that prophetic word, uh, or the last part of that prophetic word, in that thou shalt bruise his heel. We find this word also there in Philippians 2, wherefore God has high... Or I should back up, and being found in fashion, man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and gave him, or and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Yes. Yeah, 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 it's a better, it is a fuller understanding. It, it is beings that he's referring to there, not trees and grass and stuff like that, and the natural things like that, but, but beings. Thus, the first vague and vital prophecy recorded there in Genesis 3.15 points both to his first coming and moves immediately to his second coming, and then immediately moves on to the new heavens and the new earth. Because that all those three things are encompassed in that one verse, 315. His first coming has to do with, the, with Satan bruising his heel. His second coming has to do with him bruising his head. And the full, full, final fulfillment of him bruising his head has to do with the new heavens and the new earth when he is thrown into the lake of fire. So you see in that one verse, he has moved from the first beginning, from the, actually from the incarnation, into the first coming, to the second coming, to the new heavens and the new earth. Boom, boom, boom. And now, everything is commentary, right? Everything is commentary from there. You just take that one verse, and now everything is commentary about that one prophetic, first prophetic word of God given in the garden to the serpent. Thus, then, again, it is rightfully applied to his first coming. It is often, this verse is often applied to his first coming, and rightfully so but will be finally completely filled up with its meaning at the application of God's purposes tied to his timeline of which we will speak of later. Are you all with me? I've thought of many things I should say maybe.
First of all, do you see how that last paragraph that I just wrote and read to you is a reference back to types and shadows? Because it took that a period of time layering over and over through prophetic word of God the, the types to finally give the fullness of the picture wherein we could see the outcome of the final meaning of that prophecy. It is. It's a, it's a great deal of all these things that we're saying today have to do with what Christ was speaking to, to the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees about in that Moses wrote of me. Well, they couldn't see these things. They didn't see them, although they should have seen some, but they saw not. They should have seen that he was, this scripture, 3.15, Genesis 3.15, was fulfilled in him. That they should have seen. He is that whom God said would take authority away from Satan. They should have seen that. That the, this, this pointed toward the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But in their mind, they could not see the suffering Messiah. And so they rejected him as that one. And this timeline thing, we'll get back to in a different, at a different point that calls more for it than now. As to this completing fullness in specific time, it will, it will be seen more and more clearly as we compare and lay over all the appointed prophets prophesying in their appointed times until finally all that God purposed to reveal was written by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. That final uh, commentary that was necessary for us to get the fullness of the picture that God wanted us to comprehend was completed with John. That was one. That was number one heading under recreation and man. <laughs> I don't know why, but now we're going to two. Number two. God's stated purpose in the creation of man is this, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Again, what is in final view in Genesis 3.15 is Jesus Christ's victory as the Son of Man and second coming millennial kingdom and then afterwards in completeness in the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, the scripture will be completely filled up with meaning in the new heavens and the new earth. It, that is seen for us and given to us to see in the prophetic picture of Revelation 5, 11 through 13 that says, And I beheld, this is John, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's those billions. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Oh, we have then the we have then, when that is realized, we'll have seen the fulfillment, the filling up in fullness of the meaning of Genesis 3.15. Number three, Genesis 2.15, it is written, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden they, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now it is here that I've made note to myself, potentially, in this syllabus or this book, that I'm going to now do a pre-fall drawing and understanding of spirit, soul, and body. But having had done that before, and most of you, if not all of you, are familiar to at least a certain extent 
with that, those teachings that I have brought forth would understand that that would take the next hour or two to put up here on this board to fully ferret it out and to explain how it, how it is and what it is that a man fell into and now is, is victoriously taken out of and the future and the potential and how those inner things work inside of us, it would take several hours and this board. So I'm not going to do that, at least here and now. I may, as I said, pull this out and put it in another chapter. You know, that was supposed to be a part of this chapter. But as you can see, and we're on page five and we've got a few more to go, I couldn't have added that without adding a lot of dialogue and time to this lesson. So rather than do that, I think I'll save this whole understanding of spirit, soul, and body for its own chapter and explain it more thoroughly. I'd like to get down to the nuances of the spirit, the soul, and the body, what they are and how they work, and really lay it out to bear for you again. So I'm going to save that for another lesson down the road. Maybe next lesson. might be the next week. I'm not sure yet. But moving on from that, because we have been, we had... We need to have to at least know something about that for we have these words of God uh, that if you do eat of that tree, you shall surely die. In that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So I've written here a few other very important keys to understanding the overall uh, truths that are going to be set forth in the rest of the remaining of the book that the fallen man from his very good state into a state of death is a consequence of the deception of Eve by the slandering serpent and acquiescence of Adam. I'm on page five, last paragraph. The word tells us that that was the way it was so. In 1 Timothy 2.14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, you might note something also that someone here had, I don't want her to get too prideful, so I won't mention who, but somebody else had also suggested that I type in all of these as, so that we didn't have to go to the Scripture, and I just didn't make the reference and then not go and so forth. So I put, as reason it's a little bit more lengthy and laced in, in pages, it's really not going to be any more lengthy in time because much of this has to do with me putting into to the text, the, the verses to which I reference. And here is that reference of the, the statement that Eve was, uh, was the one that was approached and that the slandering serpent brought her under deception and then Adam acquiesced. And I looked up the word acquiesce. I, I needed to use the right word. You know, this is structured. Even though I'm limited, very limited in my 500 words of English, I still have to structure them in the way that I think is, tells the story the best. I wish I was a stronger-minded man that had the, the vocabulary of some men that I admire. But what I have is what I have. And so I have, what I make up, what I lack in intelligence and and gifts I, I make up in dog determination. So I look these things up and make sure that I'm saying what I mean. And I have said in times past things like Adam rebelled. And because I said rebellion because if he wasn't deceived, then he rebelled. But I see in the word of God in between the lines and in the tone of the scripture with Adam's, you know, Adam's comments that he really wasn't in a rebellious state of mind. He, he wasn't a rebellion. He was, you know, in his words, as we'll read in a minute, he wasn't rebellious toward God. And so it was more, the word acquiesce m means you reluctantly went along with is probably more appropriate to, to Adam than to say he, he rebelled. You know, he, she was deceived, but Adam rebelled. That, that doesn't tell the story. So I use this word acquiesce thinking it would be the best. If you have a better word, I'm welcome in welcoming it, your input, but I think you can see what the point of what I'm saying is, is so. Now, as a result of their disobedience, <clears throat> that we can agree on, they immediately experienced the terminal effects of death. 
That is, that is, in the absence of the animating spirit, the mind loses its compass. My mind in the spirit, with a spirit-dominated being, would always be, be focused and pointed in the right direction. But the moment I lose my spirit, I lose my compass. And I wander in the wilderness of carnal reason and senses. And that makes most good sense when I have to spend that two hours building for you spirit, soul, and body. Then when I say that, bang, boom, it makes sense. I, if Robert was here, he'd tell you. Because I went through this with Robert detail by detail, and he still quotes things I said to him about spirit, soul, and body and brings them to point at the right appropriate times because it's stuck in him. It's stuck in me. Thank you. I, it's a new way of wording it. I've never heard it. I've, I just It came to me as I was writing. I liked it when I finished it. If, if I read these notes over three times, there'd be three different versions. So I have, I have to limit myself. I have to read it over because I do God quickens things. And here's what it says, and I broke the chain of thought, but to repeat myself, this death experience is terminal. That is the absence of animating spirit. The mind loses its compass and wanders in the wilderness of carnal reason and senses. And the word says, and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked. There's no better other way than to describe how they had lost the compass of their spirit when it is is the emphasis of what they now have, uh, comp they now comprehend through their reasoning and their flesh is that they are naked. Somehow, having the spirit led, controlled being, that was not of importance. Some say they were ignorant of it, some say they were innocent, whatever. I say that it was just the contrast of being a spiritly, spirit dominated being as opposed to one that was no longer spirit dominated. Now, that is what's at the surface. That's, what's, that's what comes to bear. Their eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. In their spirit, it lost its abilities. In that their spirit lost its abilities and their quality of life, then greatly diminished. This Yes, I don't mention that here, Kathy, but I have in times past, and I still have have tendency to believe that they did have some covering like that, like the light, and that it will um, because I believe that when they were created in the image of God, it did, and they were this this more higher level of being than we are. I would think that they had something greater and beyond what you're looking at here. This is the, this is the fallen condition of man. This body has not been restored in any way, shape, or form. It's the very same body that Adam found himself with at that, this day we're reading. And the, the fact lends itself to me that his spirit suffered, his soul suffered, as we shall see, and his body suffered. This, this is not what it was. So I'm still of a mind to believe that if it wasn't the Shekinah glory of God emanating from him, it was some other type of light-filled, light-emanating being from them that had, had covered them in the shadow, uh, shadowed them in glory. Now, I'll say it that way. It shadowed them in glory. It's sparkling, maybe. And, and you couldn't see the defining, uh, the defining features you couldn't, it, like, you can't see my defining features. It, you couldn't see the, that, that the nakedness because they weren't naked. I mean, they, if they weren't naked, they had to have a covering, right? They discovered they were naked. It was not because they didn't know that, it's because they were now naked. Do you see it? <laughs> it isn't that they, their mind opened to their nakedness so much as that they now were naked. They weren't in that same condition that they were in before. Immediately, their eyes were opened, 
their understanding was illuminated to the fact they were naked. That's a poor way of describing you by using those words. Illuminated is not a good way. It's because it wasn't illumination as much as it was embell embellished in, in covered in darkness. That's, a, that's the darkness of the lie in a, uh, Matthew chapter 6 where it says, how, if that light be in you, darkness, how great is that darkness? So there is a light that is darkness. And so I shouldn't say illuminating in the sense of a light. It's illuminating in the sense of darkness that they discovered and their eyes were opened in darkness. Yeah, that would be the, that would be the positive and the negative. The negative is that they wait. The yeah, the beginning and the or the the beginning and the middle unto the end. That, there's still there more yet to be seen of that. But what the, what we see is what we see at regeneration is a quickening of what they lost. So in the negative on them and in the positive on us, even though that's not the fullness of what is promised. The quickening regeneration. So catching back up to where I was and the thought that I was trying to convey, it was, it was there where right after I had, had expressed the word of God in these words and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked, in that their spirit lost its abilities and their quality of life then greatly diminished. And I've said all along in many ways, that is, that this is the quality of life that we are uh, in pursuit of as being regenerated. It's not the eternal life that it, where is our focus, eternal having to do with length, but we're looking to now the quality of the length of our life. So here we find this, they lost that quality of life that they were created in. This, is, this now being their immediate condition, then fills the words of, for in this day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, with meaning. As the spirit was infected and suffered death, in the same day they disobeyed. But they themselves, that is to say, they themselves, not their bodies, did not experience the full effect of that death. Let me read that again because my mind was about a drawing that I thought I should make. When I was reading that, I was thinking, you know, <clears throat> just, just for, a, for one, just take one minute, and I bet it won't be longer than a minute. I just want to draw one thing up here to, to that will visualize for you what it is that we're talking about. Many of you have seen this many times, and this, this is what we are. This is our body. This is what we're, how we're made up, the body. This is our soul, or our very essence, and then this is the spirit. So it's that animating part of us, that of Adam, that we now discover has lost its abilities. And you can, you can portray that by just darkening it up like that, or you could portray it by shrinking it up and making it look like a prune. <laughs> Uh, you, you, can't, you can't depict what's happened by get, doing away with it because it's still there. It's still a part of it. Without our spirit, we won't be alive. Without our spirit, we would not be alive. Now, with the spirit that we have, we don't live very long. Okay? Because if we had their spirit, we'd live on and on and on and on. <laughs> and on. And even in there dead stay, stead also to their bodies and souls passing in that in that day is a thousand years and no man ever lived over a thousand years old and the word of god says that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as as a day so you could argue that that scripture really means 
that in that day, 1,000 year period, you shall surely die. But I do me believe that what is being meant there is both, both in that day, 24 hours, and in that day, 1,000 years, you shall surely die. In the day, 24 hour period, your spirit shall die, and in the day, 1,000 years, within that time period, your soul and body will pass. So I don't ever bring that up. I've never, I don't know I mean, if you guys have heard me say that before, but I, I don't usually bring it up because I think it kind of convolutes the meaning of what's being portrayed here in Scripture, that the spirit, and we need to see that something died because it's, there's this immediate transition in their being in, the, in all the way that they are. And again, I'll read it one more time. As the spirit was infected and suffered death in the same day, they disobeyed. But they themselves, that is to say, they themselves, not their bodies, did not experience the full effect of that death and returned to the dust until hundreds of years later. But the fact of their spirit's abilities being greatly diminished did have an immediate death effect on them as now they were doomed to be eternally carnally minded, soul and sensual body controlled. Their, this condition was irreparable. I mean, it couldn't be changed. It, this is it. This is what the Word said. In the day that you eat, you shall surely die. It doesn't say, and for a thousand years, and after that you shall live again. It doesn't say that. This, this was man's state to be forever. And would have been had there not been other factors that God mercifully intervened. Well, that's a part of it. I'm glad you're with us here today, Jerry. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a good comment. I mean, it is. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the bottom line of what we find. And just not even the baptism, just, just the, the, the power coming to bear upon this spirit, obviously, changes it. But that's for another lesson. Right now we're focusing on, we're focusing on this very, uh, that is not right. What was the key? Yeah, that was it. It was uh, number three key, which is, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress and keep it, find, ending up with, but the tree of knowledge, good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that's the focus of what it was that God had given them to do and what they didn't do and what they didn't did do by eating of the tree. And then the consequence of the result is what we're seeing and that their spirit had immediate effect upon their bodies and they themselves became doomed to a to a carnally minded uh, state and sensual body. That's what the flesh is. Right? The flesh. Flesh equal carnal mind plus sensual flesh or body. Right. Thank you, Kathy. Body. This is what makes up the word flesh. When we talk about the flesh, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about just this or just that. We're talking about these two together have conspired now. <laughs> they are in conspiracy uh, against our spirituality. So it is that doomed state. I mean, it was just going to be forever bad. They were never going to come into that intimacy or fullness of the knowledge of God in any way, shape, or form without a spirit, without an enlivened, inanimated, reanimated spirit. And I think we just need to stop and think there for a minute. That's, that's what happened. And that was where we were doomed to be. And when we are born into this earth, that is our state. That is our state. We are doomed. Just like Adam was doomed that day that he ate. We are doomed. And we see that this is this doomed, carnal-minded, essential body state in the response of Adam to God's 
call. Note that I put call, I emphasize the word call and capitalize the word. Here's the response of Adam to God's call. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. There it is. He owns it up. And we have the description of that condition in Romans 8, 6 through 8, where it says, For to be carnally minded is death. He has just experienced, he was the first one to experience it as a human being. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh, soul-minded, cannot please God. So it is. So it's found that in this triad being now fallen... In this state, it is impossible. Doesn't it say? Impossible? It's impossible. You are at enmity with your flesh is at enmity with God. You are carnally minded. You will never find God through the mind, the carnal mind. You'll never find Him. That's why religion has come up with all these other substitutes because they can't find God, but they can find these substitutes through reasoning and sensuality of their flesh. These are gods of the flesh. All these gods that they come up with. And you'll never, they would never, man would never in this state be able to find God. Because it's by the Spirit. And so now Adam, man, Adam, man, hopelessly carnal, fleshly, that is to say soul and reason controlled, as opposed to his original good state, wherein he is spirit enlivened and led and controlled. So now he is, in this fallen triad state, he is controlled by his soul and body. By his flesh, he is now controlled. And no one in that state can please God. Matter of fact, they're under a curse. Before, <laughs> before he was a spirit controlled. Living soul. That was Adam's state before the fall. It is here that we discover the merciful work of God. And man, I just had to stop and pause and just think what an awesome God God is. It is here we discover the merciful. Yeah. I can, but I want to save it for another lesson because, because it, it, takes a, it takes a great amount of time, right? So, but quickly, we, we, we know that the body has five physical senses, right? See, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And then we then know from the Word of God that the soul has its senses. It has the intellect. It has emotions. It has imagination. Are you with me? It has, most importantly, it has a will. Okay? And so those, all the emotions, the emotion, emotion. Ooh, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm glad. I'm like, yeah. I mean, really, think about Adam. He was a mature, spiritual being, and suddenly he was emotionally controlled. I was afraid, and I was naked. 
These are, these are things he had never experienced before. It was whoa, whoa, whoa on me. I mean, you could, he wanted to kill himself. I'm convinced he wanted to kill. He was whoa, whoa, whoa. And it was because he now became controlled by these sets of senses instead of what he had always had as his compass, the Spirit of God, that organ that had conscience. It had conscience. What else? Intuitiveness. And communion. This is what he lost. The greater part of his conscience, all of his intuition, and all of his communion. That's, that, that in great depth is coming. We're along with types and shadows. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's hallowing God. Hallowing God is loving God with all your being. And all that is reflected in the scriptures. All these things that I would be talking about, the types and the shadows are there. That, such as the outer court, the inner court. The Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, the Holy of Holies, all of these things type the earth, the heavens, the heaven. All these things are types and shadows. <laughs> yeah. 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 And understanding that it is an act of your will, not emotions, to love God because it's the will that connects to. The Spirit. Blah, blah, blah. Those are exciting inner... Pardon me? <laughs> That's the temptation. That's the temptation. That's confession of our, our yet immaturity. And, uh, and a pointing in the view of maturity is the recognition of, you know, we have not yet. In some things we've gotten good, Jerry. You've gotten, you've grown exponentially in your dedication and your love for your wife. I know that. I know your testimony. I know your past and your present testimony speaks to that great growth that you by opening the will of your heart to the Spirit of God and setting your mind on the course of the Word of God, you have now grown maturely, spiritually in that area. Now, in this other area, <laughs> where, wherein you now speak, you feel compelled to be... Yeah, okay. No, it's okay. I'm going to stop right there before I get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It, it, if we're always in a state of prayer, we won't be in a state of sinning. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, come on, get back to the lesson. It's your fault. I'm running late. Yes, yes. He, he, Adam, now finds himself being co totally. He has no other choice. He, he's just found, found himself in a state, a severe, extreme difference. Can you see it? Just wham! And it didn't happen, you know, over a period of a thousand years. Wham! And so, no, no, no question that he was afraid. No question that those things that he was expressing were was the real uh, condition of his heart and mind. It is here that we discover, I'm, it is in this dynamic, 
It is here we discover the merciful work of God in the first persuading calling of love. He said, Adam, where art thou? It is, not call, it is not a calling that God might be aware of where Adam is, but a calling where Adam might be aware of where Adam is. Right? I mean, it, was, it wasn't a puzzle as to God as to where he was. He knew, he knew exactly where he was. But the call went out. Adam, where are you? It's a loving, merciful call because he needed him to come forth. It was in the mindset of God from before the foundation of the world. Adam, where art thou? Unto his conscience was he speaking and calling. Unto this fallen part of his being was he calling. He wasn't calling to his emotions. He wasn't calling to his intellect. He wasn't calling to his senses, his body senses. He wasn't calling in any of those areas. The only thing he was speaking to was that portion of the conscience that he left in him after he had disobeyed. It was that which was designed in the tree of knowledge of good and evil that wouldn't wipe him out of existence, but would leave enough in him that there was life that he could hear a call. Do you see it? That was in the design of God. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by lucky chance. It was because God had designed that eventuality. In that, in its disobedience, it wasn't the Xing out of man because he had a greater purpose in mind before creation than that. Adam, where are you? Is a call today, not to your flesh, not to your emotions, but directed right at your old prune sized spirit. Randy, where art thou? We all heard it. And we all have responded to that voice. As the carnal soul hides in the leafy covering of reason in a false sense of security, then upon hearing the word of God is disturbed. He was disturbed. He said, I, I heard you. I heard your call, but I was afraid. Sin awareness becomes acute. Self-examination results. The discovery of enmity between the stirred but emancipated spirit and the carnal sense controlled soul flesh happens. An impasse results. Romans 1, 18, 20, 28, 32, with 2, 6, and 16. We'll come back to that in a moment and read those scriptures because they, just laying there alone, have no ability to explain. But he, he now hearing the call, was stirred in his spirit. It set at odds. It saw the setting of odds between the enmity of his spirit and now uh, unanimating and his soul and flesh. There was something now that was struggling one against the other. And this struggle resulted in a decision. A decision with action is required. When God said, where art thou? There was a certain response that was required for him to address you. And without that response, there, that correct response, then there is no addressing. It's only where art thou again? Where art thou again? Where art thou again and again and again? For the whole lifetime, you may hear where art thou and never respond rightly or accordingly and never hear God. But he did. He had action, didn't he? He, he came out from hiding when God called and he spoke to God. A decision with action is required. Regeneration and hope for restoration is at stake. Did you, did you see that I put a, two things there? Regeneration and hope for restoration is at stake. 
It is the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart in progress. The call is the work of the Holy Spirit in progress. And it's in progress as long as the will gate is closed. Adam, where art thou? It was closed. I was afra- I'm afraid. I'm not going out there. I'm not going to. I'm not going to let him see me, and I'm not going to talk to him. I, I'm yeah, whatever. And he sat there, and the Holy Spirit was working upon his dead conscience, wasn't it? And it was only when he decided to open himself up to God's rebuke, right? Wasn't that what he's afraid of? Man, look at what I've done, and now the condition I'm in, I don't want to talk to him, I don't want to see him, I'm just in the, it's happened, and I'm just going to go on my way. No, but the moment that he decided, no, I need to own up, I need to fess up, I did sin, I did, then the will gate opened, and he moved in action, and he stepped toward God. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. That's the truth of what happened here after the calling of merciful calling of God unto this fallen man, Adam. The question was, will Adam decide to answer the call, come into the light, or remain in darkness? John 3, 3 through 10, 20 through 21. We'll also address that in a minute. Adam's action and words speak of confession, do they not? Adam's words and actions speak of confession. He said, Adam said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Here's his confession. Remorseful, maybe a little indicting, but uh, I think more remorseful than it was trying to shed. Uh, he's looking for a little avenue of, of mercy in his statement. But the, the, the part that God needed to hear with and see was the action of moving toward him, coming into the opening, owning up to where he was at, and then confessing his sin. Confession and repentance is the necessity for forgiveness and rebirth. Is that not true? Isn't that Romans 10 somewhere? Confession and repentance is the necessity for forgiveness and rebirth, reanimating, reanimating the regeneration of the spirit. In that forgiveness, in that forgiveness, we have the testimony in that secured, I should write, in that secured forgiveness, we have the testimony of these words. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Do you see that? Do you think I've went beyond what the Word says? Do you think that by Him, God providing them with coats of skins and and clothes them, does that speak and testify to Him forgiving them? Doesn't it? Come on, you ought to be able to say amen to that. He he wasn't going to give them coats of covering for their nakedness and, 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 and comfort them had he not forgiven them. He forgave them because they repented. They confessed and repented, which is what he was looking for in the call to their hearts. And you say, well, now, wait a minute. That sounds like you think that they were born again. Exactly. You think that they were unregenerated, fell. Then you're saying now they were born again. Yes, I'm saying that. I believe the scriptures prove it up. And I'll, for one example, I'm not going into great depth. That's the Romans 1, 18 through 20. Here, here's the challenge to you and I. Thank God that we did not remain in this condition. Romans 1, 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now that scripture was addressed to you and I and all those that find themselves born of Adam, unregenerate into the world. But we are looking at Adam, and in, in from if you can look at this verse as it relates to Adam, you can see that he had the, within him the power to deny the truth of righteousness, to deny it, uh, and he could have, but he didn't. He, he allowed it. The wrath of God was upon him immediately. That imprecation of the eating, of, uh, the disobedience of him, the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had settled on him. And so therefore the wrath of God was on him. And he could have very well rem- chose to remain in such a state. Look at the verse 28 in that same chapter, Romans 1, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He could not, he could have not, he could have not desired to have the knowledge of God, to retain the knowledge of God. Uh, He could have refused to hear the call. Are you with me? And then verse 32 who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. We don't know how long it was before God uh, manifested himself after the, the fall, do we? We don't know. It doesn't say, and the next day God came down to walk in the cool of the day with his doesn't give us that insight. It doesn't give us any insight. So it could have been a while. It could have been. And possibly and probably was. Because reason, reason is what they chose. They allowed God to be slandered and was said, If you will eat of this tree, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God's holding back something from you, and if you'll eat of it, I'll share with you what it is, and you'll see what it is that God's been holding back from you. Bang, they ate. Now, it stands to our reason that he now was the tutor. He was the tutor. He gave them a tutorial on the flesh. He he allowed them to experience the pleasures of the flesh. Are you with me here? Which adds credibility to Adam having been presented in the same circumstances to Adam that I'm reading to you in Romans 1. And he could have, having had those experiences and those reasonings and the A mighty foe he is and was. Nothing even better than getting him to fall than to get him to now rebuff. What would be better now that I've got him to fall through through uh, deception? Now him being where he is to be like to me, wherein I I refuse the mercies of God in that I would rather be me than be me rather than to be controlled by him. He's now tutoring this being. What would have been better than now that when he came, Adam, where are thou? None of your business. Yes. Well, he knew, he knew that what he did know is that 
God is now doing something different than what he did with me and my fallen angels. And uh, whatever it is, it looks as if it, that God is going to now raise this being up to have the authority that I had once here. And in that in itself set him against him in itself. And he then conspired and uh, made his plan and was successful. Y'all are getting me way off. <laughs> I've taught you before. Adam was a man. That's it. He's created. But God ran all those beings by him and he couldn't find a companion. So he brought Eve out of Adam. So what he brought out was, was in, at once in union. Is now outside. Right? And what's out was more susceptible than that that when it was in, or when it was twice, it was more than twice, it was ten times stronger within, but without, the weaker vessel is this. Okay? So it's very simple. Attack the weak, because the stronger loves the weak. We get the stronger if we get the weak. And that's not to bring any slander it, it doesn't, I don't even mean weak. I mean those other characteristics that are more susceptible to something, to his subtleness. Uh, that's just the way it is, or was, and that's the way the word, I believe, portrays it. So it, it is in that, yeah, he observed, he knew, he, he watched God create Adam, then he watched him bring in and look and saw and Watch them exist and wa listen to them commune and whatever else. But anyway, we'll, we'll see why I make a point of that here in a moment. If I can find where I was. You guys got me so far off. Well, he was confessing, right? And the woman whom he gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Confession and repentance is a necessity of forgiveness and rebirth. Reanimating, regeneration of the spirit. In that forgiveness, we have, and I was going to go there, but I don't have time now. In that forgiveness, we, I was going to proof up for you that the old covenant had a form of recreation, regeneration in it, just as the, the new covenant does. Uh, in, that for, in that forgiveness, we have the testimony of the unto Adam also, and to his wife did the Lord God make coats and skins and clothe them. So there, there's where we stop. And moving forward, with the first establishing of that great truth that has, that has Christ's blood in view. Here it is. It's first speak. You may hear, hear me say that before? It's the power of first speak. This is the first time it's spoken of, and if he spoke it out once, it's the same throughout. God never changes. You can take a first speak, and you can work the first speak into everything all the way to the end. That's how he tells the end from the beginning, in that anything that he first speaks here will be played out all the way to the end. So in first speak here, the first thing that he brings to our attention is that without the shedding of blood is no remission or forgiveness. That's what's to be understood in the blood sacrifices. That's what was to be understood in that, that God clothed them with those skins of those animals that had shed their blood. For without the shedding of the blood of those innocent animals, there was no restoration for their soul. I put that wrong. Without the shedding of the, the blood of those innocent animals, there was no possibility for the remission, forgiveness of sins. Is that not what the Word of God says? Oh, you don't like it. Oh, well, I like animals too, and I don't like enjoy the thought, but that's the way it is because soul for soul, flesh for flesh, blood for blood. This is, a, this is that pre-foundation of the world plan that God had formulated in him that it would require to meet 
the propitiation of the justice and holiness of God that it could not be just immediate remission from confession. Oh, I'm sorry, God, I did that. Okay, you're forgiven. But that, that it had to be based on something de with depth to it. And life, the life uh, uh, is represented in the blood. And taking that blood re re took the life of the innocent animal that met the propitiation of God to remit their sin. It's not that it's not serious to God to have an animal slaughtered in our behalf, but it is, it, it's the only thing that could meet the, 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 uh, the requirement of God's justice and holiness. So he instituted it. He brought it to pass. They covered themselves with leaves, but God covered them with the blood. And he remitted their sins. He forgave them. And in the forgiveness came regeneration. He regenerated their spirit. Not unto that enlivened condition in wherein it was before, but it was in a more it was in a more of a condition that it could offset the flesh. Before, it was just an automatic. We're walking according to the Spirit. Hallelujah. But now, we're walking according to the flesh. And God, rather than them just automatically walking again in the Spirit, now required the Spirit with the will of the soul to overcome the flesh. Now, okay, we're going we're gonna to liven that spirit enough, not where it's now automatically controlled like it was in the original creation, but in enough the generation of life, life, life. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. See, it's immeasurable. Life, it had enough life in the spirit that it all set the will aligned with the soul carnal soul. Are you with me? So that portion of regeneration that came that put them back in a state where now not back into that holy state they were created in, but back in a state wherein they were accountable. Hopefully I said that in such a manner that you understood what I was trying to say. Finishing. That was Hebrews 9.10, and without shedding blood is no remission. And then with this other scripture, I think it really drives it home. It's Leviticus 17.11. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. How could it be more clear than that? It was the blood of the innocent animals that atoned for their sins. Duh. That's second speak. First speak, all the way through. Come with Christ, you're going to find the third or the fourth speak, whatever number it is, His blood. But His blood, of course, has a higher level of efficacy than the blood of innocent animals, which is another whole lesson. And we're getting there, but we're laying this groundwork because now we're talking to the devil. Now we're talking about the fall and God's curse and what God intended. I'm going to contrast regeneration and reconciliation as reconciliation as opposed to restoration. Have you heard me say it before? You have on the one side you have reconciliation. On the other side you have reconciliation and restoration. The greater is reconciliation and restoration. The lesser is is reconciliation. This is the gift. This is the prize. That's another whole way of looking at it, but we'll, we'll look at that at a later date as well. Page 7. But what is of great note is that although Adam has repented and God has thereby forgiven and atoned for his soul eternally through the blood sacrifice of those animals and that they are now reconciled, is that not? We'll just assume that that's so. 
at the moment. But we see in chapter 323, they are not restored. Because in 323, it says, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. So we have reconciliation, we have forgiveness, we have the shedding of the blood, but we don't have restoration. That speaks to that they are not back into the same nature that they were in. That speaks that they're still being held to a certain accountability for the sins that they had did, even though they had been forgiven, because God said, you're not going back into the garden. Which speaks to another shadowed truth established here from the beginning, that being the blood atonement alone does not answer to restoration. Ooh. What? I'm saying that, that God clothed them with the skins of the animals having had shed the blood and had paved the way for the remission of the sin. But that blood alone was not sufficient, although it was sufficient for, recon or sufficient for remission, it wasn't sufficient for reconciliation. And so therefore, it is a law, or speak, all the way through, the blood atonement alone does not answer to restoration. So whether it be the blood of innocent animals with the lower efficacy or the, with the higher efficacy of the blood of Christ, the blood alone will never, never meet the requirements for restoration. That's first speak. I just brought it all the way through. Now, it rubs religious folk wrong, but... Once they have seen the fullness of the truth and the plan, the mindset of God from the beginning to the end, then it fits in. So forever, forever, from then and forever, the blood cannot do what something else can do. That further work, that further work is, is animated here. That there is a further work is intimated in that he's now out. You are forgiven and you have much sins are remitted, but you are not restored. And so there, that implies a further work. That further work in what the blood cannot do is to be thoroughly addressed in later chapters. But Genesis 3.17 says, speaks to the loss of the garden's complete provision in close intimacy with God. Stay with me just a few more minutes. I'm almost done. I think this is the last page. It is, isn't it? Is there an eight? Nine? Oh, move on. Shh. Quiet. Forget what I just said. <laughs> Genesis 3.17 speaks to the loss of the gardens. I, th I sense maybe your interest is, or maybe your, is it waning? Or you there still? Genesis 3.17 speaks to the loss of the gardens complete provision in close intimacy with God. And types on a spiritual level that increased enmity between the spirit and the flesh after reconciliation of the spirit while living on the earth. Does anybody know what I just wrote? Because that seemed confusing to me. You know what I wrote? I wrote that even after this remission of sin and after the re the restoration, not the restoration, I should write, after the regeneration of the Spirit, there yet is a understanding from the Scriptures that there's a work that needs to be done, and then on a spiritual level, there is an increased enmity, enmity now between the recreated Spirit and the carnal flesh. All right? And it'll be there. All your life. That's, that is the, the reconciling of a spirit-controlled man is to sanctify himself, bring into control himself through the spirit. But that is what is reflected here in, in these words in the, from the garden. Cursed is the ground. What ground? Well, he was speaking to the ground that they grew plants out of that they ate food for the sustenance of their body. But and from a spiritual application, the Lord is saying, cursed is the ground within. Yes. 
That's all, all uh, brought out in Scripture. He came from the ground. So you're right. It's another way of looking at spiritually speaking. Cursed is the ground within. And so, that for thy sake. Now this is difficult. But I think you can catch it real quickly. For thy sake. God cursed the ground within, which gives, opens the opportunity for the further work. Okay? That, that, sounds, that sounds like, well, whoa, wait a minute. He, he, he cursed the ground within, and that's for my sake? That's right, for the training of a royal son. It's, it's going to end up to your benefit for your sake if you will do what it is that you need to do to bring yourself back under the servitude of God by your spirit taking control of your carnal flesh. That's what's, that's what's implied in this word, for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of all the days of thy life. I have lived a long life, but it's been a tough one. That's the word of God on one prophet. It's going to be a tough one on all of us. There's no easy road down this, this, this street. This holiness street, is. there's nothing easy about it. To live on it, is, is to suffer and to sorrow. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. This is the speaking of your, your, your inward being, your flesh. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and done to dust thou shalt return. So born again, now what? We find ourselves in the condition of where the sower sows the word. Mark 4, 14 through 20. You know it, right? The sower sows the word. Some, sow, some seed falls on the, on this ground and on that ground and on this ground. And then the cares of the world, lots of other things. The thorns and the thistles, they grow and they steal away and they, they capture and they choke out, Right? We are not relieved from the fleshly cursed ground, but for the sake of required work unto fruitfulness, we are now engaged. See, this is the same that charge that God had given Adam in the beginning. Tend the garden. Now that garden is within. You can't go back into that garden because now you're not worthy. You're not in a state of that garden. You must now tend that garden that's within you. And this is the things that you have to see to for the sake of required work unto fruitfulness. If you don't tend it, it's going to weeds. We are now engaged in this lifelong battle for spiritual sustenance and productivity as a result of the hoeing and the sweating to prepare the soil and to stop the choking out of the rewarding harvest on the ground within us. This is the rationale, the mindset of God as it relates to Man having the ability within him to again ascend into the likeness of that prototype, Jesus, that obedient prototype, Jesus Christ. We may look to God's determined type as it relates to these things, just spoken in Esau and Jacob as respective representatives of the hated flesh and the beloved spirit beginning with her struggling in the, the womb of their mother, Rebecca. Whereas she having this great struggle went to the prophet to find out what is going on. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and the two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders shall serve the younger. This is the, this is the condition of all men. Uh, that, that how they are uh, how they are composed when they come into the life into this life. In this we find the strength of the elder. Do you not see that? It says, "And one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger." Well, the elder is the stronger. It's a similar situation as Cain and Abel. In this we find the strength of the elder. That is the carnal soul or flesh. This is the same. 
dynamic that we find Paul talking about in Romans chapter 7 when he says, oh, you know, what, how can I overcome this? You know, how can I overcome this, uh, this, this flesh is stronger than I am. Uh, that that I will to do, I can't do. And that that I don't want to do, I, I do do. And so this dynamic is, is speaking to the flesh, which in, its, in our uh, original state and in our baby state of regenerated beings without the maturity of the Holy Spirit on our being, in our spirit, we will be in this dynamic wherein that we will serve the older instead of the elder serving the younger. God has, God in this paradigm has, has, has predestined that the younger, the older would serve the younger. In other words, the spirit will take ascendancy over the flesh. That's the way God has predetermined that his sons will accomplish the work, further work of being outside of the garden and that garden now being within that they must now tend. That's the work. Bring the elder under subjection to the younger. The younger is the new man. The weaker is the new man. But it is strengthened by the yielding of itself unto the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit within. In the, in the end, in our fullness of our maturity, we will be spirit-controlled and ruled. Yes, now is, our, it, now is the day that we exercise that, that dynamic and we're required to, but in the end, in our resurrected glorious body, we shall find that that spirit returning unto us will be in the power of God. And that spirit now will automatically lead and control as it would have Adam in the garden. And as it did, only beyond. It's in a new power that, it's, that the resurrection comes. Are you with me? I get off on so many different trails, I have to pull myself back. In this we find the strength of the elder, that is the carnal soul flesh, but in the end it shall be the younger, the renewed spirit, that is appointed to rule over the flesh. And with the book of Hebrews, we see the words of the old in the further light of the new covenant exhortation from Esau's flesh apathy in lost, you remember this story, right? In lost inheritance to diligence required in faithful sons. In other words, Esau had the apathy. I am... I am, as we do, I am born again. I'm a child of God. Jesus is my Savior. And we, are, we're, we, we pronounce that all over everywhere. But we don't live according to that. We just pronounce it. And so we apathetically approach our, our Father because we, we, we perceive we're favored. We're favored. I'm favored. I'm the firstborn son. I'm Esau. And I, and I, but I love the world. I like hunting and women and stuff like that. But I am the son of my father, and I am and set for the inheritance of the firstborn. It's mine. <laughs> so I have the best of both worlds. I can. You see the point? God hated that the flesh. He hates that apathy of the flesh, the, the lack of recognition of the value of the inheritance. And that's what we as Christians oft do. We have no value. We're steeped in hunting and fishing or whatever our thing is. And we, don't, we're, we approach God half-heartedly or even not even half-heartedly. So it is in the word of uh, the light, the light of the new covenant on this old dynamic that you can go back and read about the whole story of Jacob and Esau and you can see the realities. It says there, summarized by the author of Hebrews, he says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one more... Who, who is he referring to? It, this is written to believers. He's saying, Lest there be any fornicator among you, a, a, a believer who is a profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. 
For you know how that afterward, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, hey, this is after we come to the judgment seat of Christ, and we, we say, I, I have an expectation here. I have believed in you, and I confess to you, and I've been born again, and I did many things in your name. And he said, depart from me. This is that realization that, that I had rejected Christ's nature from within. I allowed the elder to rule. I allowed the flesh to rule. I didn't allow the spirit to take ascendancy. I didn't mind the things of the spirit, Romans 1 through, 1 through 5. I didn't do that. I just confessed with my mouth, but I didn't do with my heart and my actions. My mouth was closed, but my heart was far away. And now the reality is your inheritance has been taken from, from you. You have no inheritance beyond the eternal life inheritance of regeneration. You have no further inheritance. You have no double portion. You are not the priest and the king of the tribe, the family. You lost that inheritance. You remain the child of God, but you're not the glorious royal son of God. You're Esau. Yes, ma'am. You never went past the atonement of the soul. That's right. The blood atonement. Never went on to the further work. You allow, You relied upon the blood work only. That was the point. Thank you for bringing it up. We Number four. Wow. We see that God, as a result of man's disobedience, pronounces curses. First on the serpent. This is the order if you look at it, which I did. First on serpent then the woman, Adam, and the earth. What should be noted and understood that the curses are of God. If you should not take anything out of this today, note that, that the curses are of God. And the first spoken curse points to him who is found most responsible. As God addresses two inv individuals, the serpent himself, that specific individual serpent, representing all such like creatures, first referred to in Genesis 3, 1, and, why, and actually why that reference was there, says the serpent was more subtle, likely meaning wiser and more beautiful, and therefore more acceptable, and Eve being more susceptible to him, him being that in that higher state, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Verse 14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this. In other words, I'm saying there's two here, right? There's that specific serpent creature that God created as a, as a creature of the field. And then there is that serpent that is using him or is culpable with him, is that uh, possessing him, that is Satan. So as when he addresses this serpent, he says, because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt, shalt thou go, and dust shalt eat, thou eat all the days of, of thy life. So we know not what type of creature he, he was before. We, we see him now, and we were represented in the snake. But what he probably was, was he stood more erect. He had a lot more of the similarities of a man, and that was more subtle than any of the other creatures, and therefore that is why Satan chose him to, to be culpable with in the, in the approaching of Eve. And it was then that he lost this beauty and now becomes what it is that God has said. You crawl on the dust of the earth. And then God specifically addresses Satan as the one possessing the serpent, that fallen angel Lucifer, in verse 15, he says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In this 15th verse, in these historical words, we have the de declaration of God's plan of salvation, restitution, restoration of all things, and a hint of how. It is in Satan's bruising of the his heel. heel on the cross, realized on the cross. But now in the second coming, we see this, this dynamic that God prophesied of, he shall crush your head, which is another 
word for bruise, if you look it up in the Hebrew. He shall crush your head and, or take away your authority. So we see that application here in Revelation, where we just read and quoted. We see that happening in that he is bound and cast into the bottomless pit. That's a crushing. That is a, a taking of authority. That is a fulfilling, not a filling up in meaning, but a fulfilling of that verse, Genesis 3.15. And though that, that shadowed truth written by Moses in Genesis 15 became more clear and partially fulfilled in Jesus' death and resurrection, the progressive fulfillment of prophecy in type is there, is there to be comprehended. Continuing in Christ's second coming, Revelation 22, and then finally, that which we just read, and then finally the complete fulfillment 1,000 years later in the restoration of all things of Acts 3.21, just before the new heavens and the new earth, with the serpent's head authority forever crushed in the verse that says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there we see finally that through the types and shadowing, we see the fulfilling paralleled all along the way until the final fulfilling of Genesis 3.15 is found in the very end of time. At the very end of time. So we had the beginning, and then we have the end. Thus, the original prophecy of Genesis 15 was rightly applied on several previous occasions but will finally and completely be filled up in meaning 7,000 years after it had been given, and in a very real sense, God has revealed the ending from the beginning. Period. thought that was a good place to stop. And uh, we'll... <sighs> oh, and then uh, there, there at the end, you see on that last page, you have a couple of asterisks, which I had noted back in text. One was the... This style of God addressing culpable things with Satan at the same time is also found in Ezekiel 28 when God speaks by the prophet to the prince of Tyrus and then in the same chapter he speaks to the king of Tyrus. The prince of Tyrus being a literal man and the king of Tyrus being the serpent, fallen Lucifer in Ezekiel chapter 28. And then again you find it in John 13, 27 where, God, where Christ spoke to Judah what you do, do quickly. He was speaking, addressing not only Judah, but he was addressing the serpent, the spirit within him. There's other occasions also where you can find this double speak. Well, I call double speak, but that's not a good connotation. Doesn't doesn't uh, speak of a good connotation. But you know what I'm saying. He speaks to two different uh, things or individuals at the same time. And then finally, as I said, noted just a moment ago, that word for bruise in the Hebrew means crush, strike. And what I find interesting is one of the, uh, the more subtle meanings of that word is cover in darkness. And I think that goes along just perfectly with being bound in the bottomless pit. So those are the asterisks. And uh, I, I don't know if that's the way I'll do it in the book, but I kind of like it when I read other material. I kind of like them not getting off point and by starting another point. And I like just putting an asterisk down there and just go to there. And I probably don't use asterisks enough yeah, anyway. Blah, blah. I am going to put a period at it. I thank you so much. I had your full attention, I felt, the, from the get-go, which is always nice. And then I don't feel so compelled to hurry. I did hurry just a little bit, but not as much as sometimes when I just get the stumbling over my own words and, and don't make much sense. And the reason is because I just feel, oh, you're just going way too long. But long is the name of my game. Everybody knows that. <laughs> If I stand out in nothing else, I am longer than any other teacher you know. So that's my whole source of pride right there. I'm longer. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that right? It, it's so true. Yeah. You bruise his heel, which it has that connotation as well as the nails, nails through his heel. 
But that, that in the greater context is what you're saying. He'll, he's, you're going to be beneath him. You, you'll, you know. it, it, that is. And God has a way of mixing those kinds of subtleties uh, that uh, are, can be found to be humorous uh, throughout his word. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm not erasing this from your mind. I'm just racing it off this board so that others won't see it and then sign a petition to remove me from this building. <laughs> Mark loses his job. All of the things above. No, I'm sorry. I don't want to have any telltale sign. How so? Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I tried to preempt that thought with, hey, there's a lot of scripture typed up in here. And I think it bore out that there was two, two probably two pages of the nine were, were probably, but it moved pretty well. You know, I moved pretty well. And so we were able to, you know, yeah, you're right. When it's three pages, you're in trouble. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Bless us, brother.